Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous lecture we talked a lot about the theory of second order linear differential equations. In particular we talked about the Ronskian. Uh, but if you remember the lecture before that I started out with a very concrete example right and it led to what we called the characteristic equation. This is whenever your p and q terms are constants that is they're just real numbers. Now what I showed you two lectures ago was that when you have real roots to that characteristic equation, life is good, right? You get very, very simple solutions to your differential equation, e to the first root times t plus e to the second root times t. Now, you know that that's not the only case here. There are many other cases, in fact, there are two other cases for roots of a quadratic polynomial. Today, we are going to talk about one of those other cases. And in the lecture that follows, we'll deal with the, the remaining case in a more general method. Now let's talk about the case that in particular makes me excited about mathematics because this is usually the first introduction that one gets to fairly abstract level math. And that is the case when you have complex roots to your characteristic equation. So let's recall that we have this characteristic equation Remember, we have the characteristic equation, which was r a r squared plus b r plus c is equal to zero. Now, I urge you to go back and look at uh, two lectures ago where that came from. This came from a differential equation a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero, and you plug in the onsets e to the r t. Now, let's suppose. Let's suppose we have complex roots. And I'm going to call them, say, R1 and R2. Now we know that they come in the form of complex conjugates. So that means that they only differ by their imaginary part being positive or negative. Again, this comes from the quadratic formula, right? You see this in the plus or minus in the square root term when you, when you apply the quadratic formula. That's what gives you two different roots. So in this case, we have complex conjugates. I'm going to call the real part lambda. I'll call the imaginary part mu. Now think about what this actually gives us, right? This gives, so if I put this into the form that I assumed, it gives me two solutions that look like this. Remember, I assumed e to the rt, so now I get e to the lambda plus or minus i mu times t. Now here's the thing. I didn't ask you for a complex valued solution, right? It doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning to me, right? So complex numbers sometimes get this, this misconception. We, we really poorly name them imaginary numbers and uh, you know, people think that that means that they don't really exist. They certainly very much exist. But what we need to do is we need to translate this complex solution to my differential equation into something that's real. Because, of course, we're only observing, say, real numbers as solutions to these differential equations, right? We want the output of y1 and y2 to be real numbers, not to have an i in there. Well, what can we do, right? How can we help ourselves? Well, we can remember one of the most famous formulas in all of mathematics. And this is called Euler's formula. It says that if you take E and you raise it to a purely imaginary number, so I times, we're gonna call this, this thing theta. It could be any real number you want. Well, this thing actually is equal to cos of theta plus i sine of theta. Okay, so the reason this is one of the most important formulas, uh, it, it comes from a no number of different reasons, but from my perspective, why it's so important is that it really unites three of the most famous functions in all of the study of mathematics. And in particular, it unites the three most important functions we are going to work with in this class. These are the sort of fundamental functions that come up over and over and over and over and over again when we are dealing with differential equations. It tells us that an exponential is really closely related to these sinusoidal functions, right? Cosine and sine. Okay, so how do we use this? How do we put this into practice? 
Well, let's take a look at my differential equations here. This tells me, or my solutions to my differential equations, pardon me. Well, I have e to the lambda, say, plus i mu, right? So I'll just take y1 for now. Well, I can distribute over that, uh, over that bracket. So I get lambda t plus i mu t. Now, this is actually an exponential. I can break up the exponent. And so now I have e to the lambda t. Lambda is a real number. That's a perfectly fine piece. This is just giving me a real number as an output. But now I have e to the i mu t. What I can do is I can apply Euler's formula with theta equal to mu times t. And so the result here is that I get e to the lambda t and then times cos of mu t plus i sine of mu t, which I can distribute this out e to the lambda t cos of mu t plus i e to the lambda t sine of mu t. Now I still haven't solved my problem, right? Because what I've ended up doing is just turning my a complex exponential into sines and cosines, but I've still got an imaginary unit here, right? I've still got an i in this thing. And same thing, if you were to repeat this procedure for y2, you are just going to have a minus mu t in here. Now the minus mu t inside of a cosine won't matter because it's an even function. The minus mu t inside of the sine will make this piece minus. So this is going to give you e to the lambda t cos of mu t minus i e to the lambda t sine of mu t. Now, this is the complex conjugate of y1, right? So the roots are complex conjugates of, e of each other. That be that's because you just negate the imaginary component. Also, y1 and y2 are complex conjugates of each other because you just negate the imaginary component. Okay, so it's still not really helping, but let's think about what something we learned in the last lecture. We learned about the principle of superposition. Now, let's think about that. The principle of superposition tells us this. It tells me, okay, so the principle of superposition, well, it tells me that if I want to consider instead one half of y1 plus one half of y2, this is still a solution to the differential equation, right? It says that no matter what linear combination of solutions I, I uh, put together, I still get a solution. So even though these are complex valued, they're still solutions to the differential equation. That means that I can add half of one to half of the other. But what's gonna happen here? Well, the imaginary parts are going to disappear because I'm adding it here and I'm subtracting it here. Then I get two times the real parts, but the one half takes care of that. And I get e to the lambda t cos of mu t. That's great, right? That tells me that there's at least one solution to the differential equation that gives me a purely real number. e to the lambda t times cos of mu t. I can play this game again. I could take, say, 1 over 2i, that's a constant, times y1, and I could subtract it from 1 over 2i, y2. Again, these are constants. I know that we're dwell delving into the world of complex numbers here. We don't have to worry about it too, too much. If you don't like this, just bear with me. Things are going to go back into the real realm very, very quickly. But what happens here, now the negative is going to kill the real parts. And the imaginary parts are going to be summed because these negatives are going to cancel each other out. The 2i is going to get rid of the i here and the doubling from this. And you get e to the lambda t sine of mu t. Again, very good thing. I got a solution to my differential equation from the principle of superposition that is purely real. 
So the question is, are these the solutions I should be using, right? And the, there is a specific way that we can answer that question. Again, it comes from the previous lecture. We ask ourselves, do these two solutions right here, the one with cosine, the one with sine, do they form a fundamental set of solutions to this differential equation? Remember, we have a way of precisely quantifying that, and that comes from the Ronskian. So, do e to the lambda t cos of mu t and e to the lambda t sine of mu t form a fundamental set of solutions to, and I'll write down the differential equation just so that we're all on the same page again. Remember, it's the same one from the very first video. But this is the question we want to ask because again, fundamental set of solution is very, very important because it tells us we can satisfy any initial conditions. These are very much solutions to that, to that differential equation, assuming that these are the roots. But we want to know if they can uh, adhere to any initial conditions. Well, let's do it. So my Ronskian, e to the lambda t cos of mu t, e to the lambda t sine of mu t, well, and then at t, this is going to be a determinant. So I get y1, e to the lambda t cos of mu t. And then the derivative of this, is, it's going to be a little ugly, but we can handle it. Uh, I'm going to write it as, uh, as columns here so that I can conserve a little bit of space. And then so the cosine differentiates, so I get uh, mu e to the lambda t sine of mu t. So this is all y1 prime just written in here. I just didn't want to sort of let it spill over the page. Similarly, I get e to the lambda t sine of mu t. And taking a derivative again, lambda e to the lambda t uh, sine of mu t. And then plus mu e to the lambda t cos of mu t. And now you can do the algebra on your own, right? Nothing really all that exciting is going to happen. What you can find is that the terms that involve sines and cosines being multiplied together are going to cancel out here. And in fact, what we are going to get is this. So it will be uh, mu e to the 2 lambda t. That comes from multiplying these terms against each other. And then times cos squared of mu t plus sine squared of mu t. Now this is my all time favorite trigonometric identity, mostly because it's the easiest one to remember. We know that that thing is equal to exactly one. This is the Pythagorean identity, no matter what the value of mu and t are, which tells me that I get mu e to the two lambda t, which does not equal to zero, um, for all t. So that tells me that I have a fundamental set of solutions to my differential equation. All of the solutions that I care about are really just e to the lambda t times cos of mu t and e to the lambda t times sine of mu t. Now there is one little subtlety in here and that we're multiplied by mu. That means that the only way that this is actually a solution to your differential equation is if you actually have complex roots, right? If mu is equal to zero, then your root would become lambda, which is not going to give you a fundamental set of solutions, right? Because it'll make this Ronskian equal to zero for every single value of t. So what this tells you is that you actually have a fundamental set of solutions as long as you actually have an imaginary component to your roots. And here's the best part of all of this. Applying this is so fantastically simple. Let's imagine, or let's, let's consider an example. Let's say we have 16y double prime 
minus 8y prime uh, plus 145y. So these numbers are really chosen so that I can get a nice complex uh, set of roots. And let's suppose further that I've got y of 0 is equal to minus 2 and y prime of 0 is equal to 1. Well, every time I do these problems, I start by addressing what the characteristic equation is. The characteristic equation in this case is given by 16r squared, that's the a value, minus 8r, that's the b value, plus 145 is equal to 0, which I don't, you can use whatever method you like. You can complete the square, you can do some foil here, whatever it is that you think is going to help you, or just throw it into Wolfram Alpha or another sort of computational program. Uh, and we can find that we get complex roots, R1 and R2. In this case, they're equal to 1 quarter plus or minus i times 3, or 3i. Okay, so that gives a general solution. Well, my general solution now is going to be the superposition of the two fundamental solutions. So this gives me y of t is equal to a constant times y1, which is e to the lambda t cos of mu t. So lambda is equal to 1 quarter, mu is equal to 3, so I get e to the t over 4 cos of 3t plus c2, e to the t over 4 sine of 3t. Cosine and sine, they come together in this. And now you can actually use the initial conditions. So use initial conditions. Now that we have the general solution, it's just a game of finding C1 and C2 based on what these are here. I will give you the solution. I recommend you trying this out on your own. Just make sure that you can actually reproduce what I have here for the solution. Uh, but I don't want to waste too much time talking about it because it's not uh, really that uh, brain bending anymore. Most of the hard work has been done for us because we have already identified the fundamental set of solutions, right? So in this case, adhering to these initial conditions requires minus two is equal to C1 and one half is equal to C2. The last thing I want to remind you of, how do I know that I can always solve these equations? From the Ronskian right here, right? That's exactly what the Ronskian tells you. That's what it means to be a fundamental set of solutions. The Ronskian says I can actually solve initial conditions with this. That's what we care about. Right? We care about finding solutions to this differential equation that can actually fit uh, initial conditions. That's why we wanted to get rid of these imaginary solutions or these complex valued solutions and use superposition to identify just a fundamental set that involves real values or real valued solutions. Okay, so that means that by my count, we've got two out of three cases covered for the characteristic equation one left, which we're going to tackle in the next video.